and welcome to another episode of the Healthy Heart Show. I'm Dr. Jack Wolfson, board certified cardiologist. And I'm so excited today because I get to talk to the world famous Jimmy Moore. You've known him as, from a lot of different areas, uh, living La Vida Low Carb. He was the low carb guy, and he's the fasting guy, and he's the keto guy. And he married up just like I did, which is super cool. So Christine, his wife, is on the show as well. And they are out also with their new book, uh, Real Food Keto, and just fantastic recipes in here. It's a beautiful book. You guys teamed up with a chef, Maria Emmerich, as well. And, and one of my favorite recipes that I love on here are the Reuben Slider. Check out the recipes for the Reuben Slider. So, guys, welcome to the Healthy Heart Show. Thank you for having us. What's up, Jack? Uh, all is well over here, and once again, salivating over the pictures. You know, you know, Jimmy, the, st the stuff you put out is so fantastic. The pictures, the imagery, I can tell you're spending so much um, time, money, and effort to get this message out there, and I, for one, really appreciate that. I know, I know others do as well. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, when I first started writing books, I was like, nobody's writing books for the layperson. Uh, and there was a lot of science-y kind of books, but even a lot of doctors don't know how to write in lay people language. <laughs> and so, uh, so I was trying to fill that hole and, uh, yeah, I found my niche. Yeah, no, it's, it's fantastic. Um, tell me, tell me, I guess maybe, um, some of the, some of the story, um, uh, you know, some of the backstory kind of, you know, kind of where you came from and, and how you got into low carb and then obviously becoming a you know worldwide expert on on keto and teaming up with some great people there, uh, and then of course you know intermittent fasting. And I and I also want to preface this and say, uh, as a cardiologist, I certainly approve of all of this. I think that the science is there. Uh, there are plenty plenty of studies, and I think once again, just in your travels, Jimmy and Christine, you'll tell me, and my travels and my patients, the results speak for themselves. So tell me some of your journey. Yeah, so I used to weigh 410 pounds and was on three prescription medications. And of course, everybody who gets, quote, unhealthy has to take a statin medication, which I know is near and dear to your heart, trying to get patients off of those. I was on three and I was a ticking time bomb at the age of 31, 32. I didn't really care about what I ate. I used to eat what I now call crappy garbage and it just loaded my body up with blood sugar and insulin and inflammation. It's amazing to this day, Jack, that I never developed type two diabetes with the kind of habits I had because I was drinking, and this is no lie, 16 cans of Coca-Cola every day. I was having whole boxes of Little Debbie snack cakes. I was a junk food addict, and thankfully, uh, this little lady's mom gives me a diet book for Christmas in 2003, and it was Dr. Atkins's book. And I read that book and I thought, man, this guy is whacked out of his mind. How do you eat more fat? Don't, don't you know that's going to clog your arteries, give you a heart attack, heart disease, everything that we always believed. Uh, and then eat less carbs. How am I supposed to have any energy at all? So I read that book between Christmas and New Year's and I said, well, what the heck? Let's give it a go. Uh, and I famously lost a bunch of weight. But more importantly now, in hindsight, it's the coming off of all those medications and literally never taking another med ever since that I'm most proud of. And then, of course, that spawned uh, developing a, a blog and then a podcast and then books and all the stuff that I do today. You know, uh, fantastic. You know, and, and frankly, I don't think that my diet circa 2003 was much different from yours. Now, I think obviously that's where some genetics, you know, come in. And although I was eating all that garbage, it wasn't showing up in me physically. But yeah. I'm sure in the lab testing that was done, it was there. Because I was drinking Mountain Dew, Diet Mountain Dew, Chinese food. I came out of Chicago, all the ethnic foods, deep dishes. Right. Everything, everything you could think of, way too much alcohol. And, um, and, and once again, you know, just kind of waking up. And, and back in the year 2000, I was at the American College of Cardiology meetings in Orlando, and I was a fellow at the time in training, and I heard a debate between Atkins and Dean Ornish. Yeah. And those guys hated each other. <laughs> and they went at it for 45 minutes, and I walked yeah. out of that meeting, and I said, I'm a low-carb guy. Uh, and I did, and I, and, I, and I read Atkins' book, and everything he said made sense. 
but unfortunately as a as a you know as a cardiology trainee and you know you know obviously you just fall back into the bad habits so easy let me ask you how do you avoid falling back into the bad habits you had you know I listen I've read your stuff I listened to your blog I listened to your podcast uh, you know, and, and there's a million Jimmy Moore's and Jack Wolfson's out there, but how, how do you avoid falling back on, on some of those bad foods? Yeah, I think it's just a matter of when you get into good habits, they stick just as the bad habits stuck. And, you know, they always say 21 days to change a habit. You know, if I find myself slipping, I get back to the basics again. And I think that's something I try to teach people is okay, we all mess up. If you have mess up times, it's not the end of the world. Doesn't mean you go back to the crappy garbage diet again. You just get right back on plan again. And sometimes fasting plays a role in that to speed it up a little bit. Um, I, I just think I've done it so long now, Jack, and plus I have a vested interest in sticking with it uh, now that this is my career and what I do, writing books. Um, yeah, I, I think that that keeps you accountable. Um. You know, I would, I would definitely say that as well, because whenever I'm walking around a, a Whole Foods or a natural grocers, and I think about grabbing a chocolate bar, now granted, it's an organic chocolate bar. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's dark chocolate. It's yes. so lousy ingredients, but I'm always concerned that someone is going to see me, and that's, you know, it's, it's breaking my business model if somebody, like, sees me, like, cheating or something like that, but, I mean, listen, I tell the story famously, my father died at 63 of a neurologic disease similar to Parkinson's. That's my inspiration on a daily basis, not, right. uh, you know, am I going to, you know, you know, upset a couple followers or a couple people that, you know, that do that. Obviously, the mission is much bigger uh, than, than what we're talking about. And let me listen. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, there's probably other more lucrative careers. Jimmy Moore could have chosen. Jack Wolfson, you know, was making a ton of money as a conventional cardiologist, and I gave it up to do to do the right thing. Christine, how did you, how did you, um, so aside from your father giving Jimmy the book, what, uh, what has really been kind of the, you know, how, how do you prod Jimmy along to make sure that he um, and the family stick on the program? So I think for Jimmy, he really doesn't need any prodding. I mean, he watched his older brother die of d diabetes and heart disease at the age of 41. And so I think that's why he's so passionate um, as to why he does what he does. Um, for me, I mean, it was really interesting because he started in 2004 eating this way. And, and I really didn't get on board because I, like you, was eating a crappy diet, but it wasn't showing on the outside. Everything that I was dealing with was on the inside and we weren't making the connections between the diet and the things that I was dealing with, like mood disorders, uh, panic attacks, um, joint pain, uh, endometriosis, all, all this stuff. We weren't just making the connection. So it wasn't really until 2009 that I went to the doctor. I mean, I was still encouraging to him. I wasn't saying, oh, you're eating all this fat. It's going to kill you. You know, I, I was always I think by that time I was so desperate for him to try something that would work that, you know, I, I just went along with it and supported him all the way. For me, when I went to the doctor in 2009 and had my annual blood work done, my triglycerides came back at uh, two, two, what was they? 98. 298. And um, I brought my lab work back home to Jimmy and he goes, well, you know what to do about that. <clears throat> and so at that time, I only cut out the M&M Skittles and, and Dr. Pepper. That's the only three things that I cut out. And my triglycerides dropped from 298 to 136 in just six weeks. I was still eating a bunch of other crap, but you see how big of a change that just cutting out those three things made. You're talking to a cardiologist. He I knows know. the change. I know. So, um, yeah, but I, I get, I guess what confuses me about this story is that most people, they either like M&Ms and other chocolates <laughs> or they like Skittles and those <laughs> other sugar things. Well, not, welcome to my girl. I know. That's the I'm way weird. she rolls. <laughs> <laughs> I'm weird. I, I, I pretty much liked any sweet but those, those M&Ms and Skittles were my favorite. Well, it was your thinness that well, gave no, you license. I, I take that to do back, it. jelly beans. She did, my, like, she did like jelly funny beans Funny story, too. my parents got me on jelly beans when they were trying to potty train me. So <laughs> that's why I ended up liking jelly beans so much. Sugar addiction because <laughs> you had to pee. Poop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no doubt. Yeah, over over on our side, it's uh, it's like you know my brother. My brother always liked those uh, you know nerds and Skittles and stuff yes. like that, and I was always more the more the chocolate fan. Yeah. 
I just liked it all. <laughs> uh, but so I just cut those three things out. Then 2011, we went through embryo adoption because we went through IVF in 2008. And we were told at that time we couldn't have uh, biological children. So we went through embryo adoption. We found out I got pregnant and I got really serious at that point about changing my diet. Jimmy had interviewed several people in talking about the importance of eating healthy, especially when you're pregnant. So we did, and he, he ended up, you know, getting me liver, cutting it up into small pieces, freezing it, and then I would take it like a pill. I mean, that's how yeah, I... Yeah, Chris Kresser I, taught us that. Yeah, I, I, I hate the taste of liver, so that's the only way that I could do it. We ended up losing the twins due to some genetic factors that we, we weren't aware of at the time, but I still remained serious about the diet because I was already starting to see changes in the other stuff that I was dealing with. Like I had a, an annual eye visit four months into eating this way. And since I was born prematurely three months, uh, at, at, uh, at six months I was uh, born, um, I had some eye issues that went along with that. So all throughout my life, my eyesight kept getting worse and worse and worse. But for the first time after starting ketogenic diet, my eyesight actually improved so we had to go the other direction it got better for the first time ever yeah mm -hmm. and i've been on the same prescription for seven years now and that's just really twelve hundred dollars a year we were spending on glasses that we've saved about 10k in the last seven years yeah oh. so that was that was one of many things that i saw improvements and i was able to get off my antidepressants uh she my, was on paxil for a decade yep so, and I was able to, uh, I saw my joint pain get better. So many things that, that, you know, I'd been struggling with, again, not putting the connection between diet and, and, you know, these things. So, I mean, that, at that point, that's when I really became serious and we've been eating this way ever since. Well, let me ask you this. So you, you were seeing all these doctors and Jimmy, you were seeing the doctors and they were prescribing you guys all these pharmaceuticals. How often did the doctors talk to you about nutrition, about lifestyle, about evidence-based supplements? For, for me, it was always the default of you're obese, so you need to cut your fat, you need to eat more grains, and you need to exercise. That was always the prescription. Yeah, I never, I never heard it. And as a matter of fact, at my last annual checkup, um, my calcium score kind of came back wonky, and so I asked the physician's assistant, I, I love her, but I, I asked her, you know, could it be because I'm deficient in K2 because you need vitamin D and K2 to help tell calcium where it needs to go, and she said, you know, I don't know, but I'll have to look into it, so her, to her credit, she said she would research it, but she didn't know that. Yeah, you said calcium score, so he might have thought heart calcium score. Yeah. Hers is zero, so yeah. heart calcium score, yeah. so is mine, by the way. Yeah. Okay, let, let me say this though, guys, is that yeah, I'm glad you both know it. And I'm glad it's both zero. My preference is to not get calcium, C, you know, not get calcium scores or CT scans because CT scans cause cancer and heart disease and dementia. So um, I'm glad that your scores are zero, but just so I put it out there. Um, Do you prefer a CIMT? CIMT would be obviously something that's not invasive. So, you right. know, that's ultrasound and that would be perfectly fine. And as okay. you know, I mean, there's so many amazing lab tests that are out there that we can do uh, without, you know, that are not radiation based. And since, you know, since my father had the brain disease that both of us as cardiologists were exposed to a lot of radiation doing angiograms and pacemakers, uh, I'm pretty anti-radiation, especially in the name of, of prevention. Right. But, yeah. uh, you know, there's other ways, you know, to do it. And, I, you know, Christine, you highlight in the fact, uh, you know, K2. Um, let me throw this to you guys because, uh, you know, you've got uh, some significant expertise. How do we get K2 from our food? So a lot of your organ meats, a lot of us don't eat um, organ meats today. We don't eat nose to tail. That's a big one. Organ They're so meats. awful. <laughs> no, they, they taste disgusting. So, I mean, and, and even Jimmy and I, we, we just... I have a hard time with it. So we actually take an organ complex. Um, so that's an easy way that we can get it in. Um, a lot of your green leafy vegetables have it. Um, if your gut health is happy, you know, your, your uh, gut bugs make K2, but your gut health has to be in order for that to happen. So uh, those are some major ways. Eggs is another way. So I, I'd say and we have 26 backyard you know, chickens that give us great K2. <laughs> You know, Christine, your um, degree, if you will, you, the letters after your name are NTP, 
uh, nutritional therapy practitioner. And listening to you speak, and obviously Jimmy as well, all of America, all of the world would be better off in the hands of you guys and reading your book than in the hands of a medical doctor. That yeah. is quite obvious because you're talking about K2, which most medical doctors don't even know that there is a vitamin K, let alone K1 and K2, let alone separations of K2, let alone how to get it in the food, how to get it yeah. from supplements. Um, and Jimmy, I, I love that technically, like you said, from Chris Pressford, um, uh, and, and maybe I read it from you uh, after that, but because I think I learned it from you about freezing the liver, you know, first, because a lot of people are not going to eat those organs, and that goes for liver, heart. People talk about CoQ10. I mean, that's the you know, number one place, of course, is in the heart. So we, right. we eat a lot of organ meats in the Wolfson household. So um, uh, K2, the only time that I ever eat soy is the fermented soy natto. Natto, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, there, and there's a company in New York, and I've got no affiliation with them, except for it's a great product, it's organic and it's in glass, and it's called Nurture, N-Y-R-T-U-R-E. Um, and I wanted to sell it in my practice, but because I'm a cardiologist, they're like all weird about it, like I'm gonna use it for medicinal purposes. <laughs> and, uh, and they're making a big deal out of it, but it's still a, a good product. It's, it's the only time I've had soy in 10 years. They being the medical board, who's giving you a hard time about it? The company. The, the, oh, Nurture's giving you a hard time oh, about wow. it. Oh, wow. giving you a hard time about it. Why would they care? <laughs> wow. You know, who knows? It does taste good, though. Um, you know, Jimmy, I, I, want, I want to tell you also another story that, um, because when you say, like, you know, you are overweight, but you never developed diabetes, and maybe obviously you had insulin resistance and high insulin, I mean, who knows what the numbers were back then. That's right. But... Um, uh, a good friend of mine from medical school, his father was, was markedly overweight. And he would, my friend would always comment, he's like, oh, my dad's way overweight, but his cholesterol's great. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't have diabetes. And, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's all genetics. And then he got cancer. Mm. You know, so it's like something's always coming around the pike. And if you search enough, obviously those people, as we do now, with, as we know now with advanced lab testing, uh, yeah, of course, I mean, insulin is very high, insulin resistance, et cetera. Well, and now we know that it's all one continuous disease uh, because we like to classify heart disease and type 2 diabetes and cancer. They're all metabolic diseases related to the insulin. And so while it may not manifest as heart disease in one person or diabetes in another person or cancer in another person, it might manifest as one of those or all of those or Alzheimer's is another one, type 3 diabetes. So I think the longer we're in this space, Jack, that's becoming clearer and clearer that we're really talking about the same singular disease, not all these classifications of diseases that we like to break them down into categories. Oh, 35% have heart disease and 20% have type 2 diabetes and 10%. I think it's all the same disease. It all stems from inflammation. Yeah. So, so what you guys are telling me, what you're saying, Jimmy, is that I spent four years in medical school <laughs> and I memorized 20 different types of skin lesions and I memorized... 15 different types of cardiomyopathy and seven types of liver failure and, and all these different labels that all the medical doctors are so good at, like you said, labels. You're telling me that all, this, all these labels are all from the same cause and cause is. Yeah, I think the underlying condition is a metabolic one, not ones related. And it's unfortunate that chronic disease has, has kind of gone this route because if we had identified it all as the same disease, then the same solution would have manifested itself sooner rather than, well, if you have type two diabetes, this is how you eat. If you have heart disease, this is how you eat. If you have cancer, this, I think we would have avoided a lot of heartache and pain and possibly prevent deaths had we been given people the right information all along about it being a metabolic disease. Yeah, most certainly. And you, you know, in your book here, you, uh, you bash and vilify Ansel Keys, um, <laughs> which, which I love to do as well. And uh, it's kind of funny that, you know, I mean, in, in, in one area, he could be such a pariah, like on our side, yet on the vegan, 
uh, you know, Joel Furman, uh, uh, engine number two guy. Uh, yeah, John McDougal. Yeah, John McDougal. I mean, like Ansel Keys is like their hero. It's like they got the shrine of, of Ansel Keys in their in their uh, bedroom. And ironically. He's the guy that came up with the Mediterranean diet, which is kind of the darling diet in the mainstream these days. Um, but, but yeah, he's most famous for that low-fat diet study that he fudged the numbers. You know, I love I love the Mediterranean diet. Save the grains, right? I mean, I think you know the Mediterranean diet. They're eating all the you know fruits and vegetables that were you know. And we're talking about obviously uh, you know low sugar. Uh, it's pretty keto. Yeah, it's pretty keto. Yeah, most certainly. What um, somebody wants to. Um, uh, diet, you know, I, I do want to make one more point too, is that, uh, at, at the local Whole Foods in, in Arizona, I would, we would shop there. You know, we, we try and spread around the wealth. We got a local, we're here in Colorado right now. We got a local uh, grocer called Mana Foods, a real tiny little place. And we try and give them all the business we can. But at the Whole Foods that I was shopping at in Arizona, there was a big sign that engine number two, uh, Rip Esselson, he's coming there to give a presentation, okay, on did you health. Go? <laughs> so not only did I not go, Jimmy, but, but when I'm, because I mean, I'm not a heckler, I'm, I'm not a heckler in the crowd and stuff like that. He's probably a lot bigger than I am too, so he'll kick my <laughs> ass. Um, I'm thinking at that moment, why, do, why don't I go down to the fire station and start giving a lecture on how to fight a fire? I mean, this guy, the fireman's coming to Whole Foods and giving a nutrition lecture. Why can't the cardiologist go give a lecture on firefighting at the fire studio? With all due respect to firemen, I love firemen. Seriously, I do. But I, I guess I would say probably stick to that realm as opposed to now you're a nutrition expert. Well, you've just described the modern day age of expert. Yeah. Um, and, and I think there are a lot of people that pretend to be experts and we see it in the keto space now, Jack, uh, as you know, I was way ahead of the curve writing this book right here, keto clarity way back in 2014. And then there was, uh, basically dead silence. There was nobody else writing about keto and then suddenly keto becomes popular. Now you have all these people popping up. Oh, I'm a keto expert and I've never heard of them before. <laughs> so it's, it, it's pretty amazing. Now, if you want to talk about firefighters and health, they just need to look at what Rob Wolf did with the first responders and how he radically changed the firefighters and the people that did the ambulance and all those first responders. I think it was there in Arizona, like Reno, no, it was Reno, Nevada. That's where it was that he did that. And so, yeah, it, it, it's sad that people will believe someone like a Rip Esselstein just because he's been embraced by the vegan community. That's why we have to be very wary of who our gurus are. Yeah, you know, I've got a friend of mine, a, a good friend of mine, um, who is a, a vegan, and he's also a cardiologist, and you probably know him, but... Um, Joel Kahn. Joel, uh, my friend Joel Kahn, and my friend yeah. Joel Kahn uh, just texted me saying that he's been dabbling with low-carb vegan. Yep, I, um, I interviewed him about two months ago about it, and was very complimentary, but then he goes on the Joe Rogan show and debates Chris Kresser and says all the vegan nonsense again. So I'm like, which is it, Joel? <laughs> Crap or get it off the pot, dude. Yeah, um, and, and I love Joel. I just, I'm trying to wrap my head around how you do low carb vegan. I mean, that's gotta be so well, tough. There is a book out there now, um, my Keto Talk. I, I do a podcast called Keto Talk with Jimmy Moore and Dr. Will Cole. My co-host, Dr. Will Cole, wrote a book about it called Ketotarian. Have you seen that one? Uh, I, do, I do know of Will Cole, and I think I have actually heard that terminology, but so Ketotarian yeah. is, I mean, so, so that, that is plant-based. Um, it's plant-based keto. Uh, he recommends highly eggs and fish so you can get the complete proteins but he thinks it could be mostly plant-based and obviously high fat moderate protein low carb to make it keto yeah i got it i got it um you know because obviously i mean coming from the you know, the traditional you know vegan side and, and and what a lot of those people what what uh, esselson i believe and um uh even uh, uh you know the china study uh, uh colin campbell and stuff like that those guys were all ultra low fat guys well if you're ultra low fat then of course that means ultra high carb uh, right so keto's out with them 
Kudos yeah, yeah. to Joe Kahn for bucking the trend uh, on the podcast that I had him on my Friday podcast. He was like, you know, I'm going to go to the vegan meet- meeting in the fall. It's already happened now. And I'm going to share my results of how I've done. Now, he only did it for a very short period of time, and he's kind of dipping his toe in the water. But kudos to him at least giving it a go and not vilifying the K-word. Yeah, you know, and I've always liked that about Joel since I met Joel back in 2012 and we were both in training together for metabolic cardiology under Mark Houston uh, at, uh, at A4M. And, uh, you know, Joel, Joel was still, he was kind of always about the science. He was all about experimenting with stuff. He was never like this, uh, you know, in just this, uh, you know, pure ideologic world where he was right. just going to stick in there and it's my way or the highway. So. Right. Yeah, I can appreciate the the lack of dogma, um, and I think it needs to be out there even more. And I even challenge a lot of my keto uh, personalities and doctors and researchers to do the same thing, and, and I am. I'm seeing that more and more, that there's not such dogma on this end of things, but from the vegan end of things, there's extreme dogma. I mean, that whole What the Health documentary was a, the biggest propaganda film I think I've ever seen. Yeah, I, I, Jimmy, I don't know how you watch those movies. I can't watch I have them. to, man. It's called Recognizance for, uh, for show content. I actually did uh, an episode of Keto Talk where I listened to that whole freaking film like four times to get quotes out of it so I could respond to it. Uh, because people were saying, oh, no, I guess I can't eat keto anymore, eat animal-based foods because of what the health. I'm like, okay, we've got to break this down for people. Well, you know, Jimmy, one of the things, and Christine, you know, one of my, one of the things my wife always says, like, why, why is there a debate about the food? Do we have to tell a lion what to eat in the <laughs> wild or a bear what to eat in the wild? Why, why do humans have to try and reinvent the diet? Why can't we just admit that we're hunter gatherers and food was sporadic, therefore, uh, you know, intermittent fasting makes perfect sense. Why, why do we have to come up with all this other stuff and these food pyramids and everything else? Why is this happening? I guess, you know, people just like to be told what to do. And, you know, with the title of our book, Real Food Keto, it's a shame that we have to put the term real in front of food. I mean, it's, it's just food. And, and that's going to look different from person to person. You know, with my clients, I may have somebody that comes in that's a little bit more athletic, they may stand, you know, a few more carbohydrates in the form of a sweet potato or something like that. But I have to look at my clients individually and most of them, frankly, are metabolically damaged. And so I will recommend a ketogenic diet for them. But yeah, it's just such a shame with all the marketing and stuff going on today that, that we have to put that clarification and call it real food. All right, Christina, aside from someone getting a consultation with you, which of course I recommend anybody soak up all the information they can from the Moors, of course, that's why I'm talking to them. Um, uh, how, how, does, how does someone jump, can I jump into the keto uh, diet or nutrition? Do I have to prepare for it? What do I need to do? Pray so, hard. <laughs> so if, if I have a client come in that's coming on the, you know, I look at their food journal and they're coming off of a standard American diet, um, I may kind of gradually, it, it, it depends on the personality because some people are like all in or nothing or some people need the, the gradual a, a approach to it. So I, I look at their personality, see what fits best for them. And if, if they are coming from the standard American diet, I will make small changes in their food journal, maybe just telling them to cut out the, the sugar uh, as a first step and then move on. If there's somebody that can go all in, I'm going to warn them that it's going to be a little bit tough. They're probably going to develop an electrolyte imbalance because they're dumping all of their glycogen. So I'll probably recommend that they do um, an electrolyte supplementation to prevent those uh, muscle cramps and fatigue and brain fog type of thing. So it just depends on the person and, and their personality. Um, they can definitely come straight from a standard American diet to a ketogenic diet, but it's going to, it's going to hurt like it did for you. It's, 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 they're going to feel the keto flu. Well, I went from six, 16 cans of Coca-Cola and whole boxes of little Debbie snack cakes to 20 grams of carbohydrates. So that hurt really bad. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
Wow. I was always a hostess guy, Jimmy. I wasn't the little Debbie's. <laughs> well, he liked those too. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was crap. I ate it. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> you know, Jimmy, I don't know if you ever saw this. You know, one thing we post annually, and now my son, he's 11. And, and truth be told, we're pretty much, uh, you know, we're trying to, you know, anti technology, the whole thing and everything, but uh, we, with some limitations. So he's 11 years old. And every year now, him and his little brother, they do the Halloween candy dump. So they get all the candy together that they collected the night before. And the next morning, we do this whole thing explaining all the toxic ingredients in the candy, what better organic candy is out there. Like if you're going to do it, there's organic varieties. And then we dump the candy. And invariably, people, there, you know, they start, well, you know, why don't you donate it to the soldiers? Or why don't you right. give it to the homeless? It's like, why would I give the soldiers, the military, or the homeless, uh, you know, Halloween candy? I don't hate those people. That's why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, it's amazing. Um, and if mama had said, well, you can keep the candy or you can have $20, I would have taken the $20. And we, and we love that as well. We love that as well. Um, okay. So as far as jumping into, you know, to keto, um, tell me some of your favorite ke uh, keto foods guys. And obviously, you know, we're talking to uh, Jimmy and Christine Moore, uh, authors. Here's the new book here, real food keto. And just once again, it's just it's such a gorgeous book, guys. I, I love that. I just the pictures, the colors, but the explanations that are it's and it's it, it's really like a, I mean it's like a it's like a food bible, right? I mean it really is like this kind of keto healthy lifestyle uh, you know bible, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, we were hoping for that that it would be people already interested in real food, they would get a little keto and understanding of that and people that are interested in keto, they're going to learn a whole lot that you're not just you know just not hearing about out there in the mainstream of keto. And then the people, this is in Costco right now this book, so um you know, we're hoping people that are just casually hearing about keto, they pick this book up and they understand the value that real food gives them because I think the micronutrition is as important, if not maybe slightly more important than even the macronutrition. So what's some of your favorite keto foods? So what's some of your favorite keto foods? I know I just made this one some bacon for breakfast oh, this that's morning. Not, that's, yeah, that, bacon is, is my number one thing. I love salmon, um, butter, salt. It has to be salted. I don't like unsalted butter, but um, anyway. So well, and, and we have 26 backyard chickens, so needless eggs. to say, we get glorious eggs. They're orange, the yolk, oh, so good. Um, and I like pork belly um, mm. and grass-fed butter. You like prime rib? Yeah, I do like prime rib with a good horseradish and sour cream. Yeah, veggies probably. Um, I love big salads with yeah, a good do. source of uh, fat on it. So absolutely get some cheese on there and some um, – like vinaigrette or something and we grow our own vegetables we got a during the warmer season we have a front yard and a backyard uh actually two backyard um garden and then during the winter time we just had uh put in this year jack a greenhouse so we've got a whole bunch of plants in there hoping that it survives we've never done it in a greenhouse before when it's 20 something degrees outside this so this will be interesting Oh, you guys are absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. Talking the talk and walking the walk. I absolutely love it. Absolutely yes. love it. Um, fasting. I've we're, heard we're of just, it. Uh, <laughs> heard about it. Uh, I, 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 there's, probably, there's probably some people, Jimmy, who think that you invented it, but you're going to tell me that <laughs> from, from biblical days, so you, you're not yes. going to take credit. You're going to give credit to the Old Testament, um, but uh, but tell me now. So so where does um uh, where does fasting come in? Uh, or let me say, why isn't keto going keto enough? Why do I have to fast? I would say that most people, when they get on a ketogenic approach, they're so satiated from the foods that they're eating, from the healthy fats, um, that you spontaneously uh, intermittent fast. And I think that just happens naturally. I remember when I first started doing nutritional ketosis, she looks over at me one day and says, when's the last time you ate? And it had been 24 hours since my last meal. In other words, I had forgotten that I hadn't eaten in 24 hours. I wasn't even thinking about food. And that's the freedom that comes with keto is that fasting, especially on an intermittent level, is so incredibly easy. 
Uh, and so that doesn't happen on day one, by the way. Don't say, don't think you're going to go keto and then day one, I'm supposed to be fasting for mm -hmm. 18 hours. Um, but it will happen over time once you're keto adapted. Now, if you want to go several days of fasting, which we now know if you fast for at least three days, you get a lot of autophagy benefits from that. So you get the turnover of the excess proteins that just float around in the body. It cleans those up for you with just three days of water and salt only fasting. Uh, I remember Dr. Thomas Seafree told me one time uh, on the Live and La Vida Low Carb Show when I interviewed him way back, like 2009, uh, he said, um, if you fast for a week, uh, seven to 10 days every single year with just distilled water and salt, you can prevent cancer. And I remember he said it at the end of the interview, Jack, and I was like, I was kind of so dumbfounded. Uh, okay, that's all the time we have today for the living with And I was just like, I, it stuck with me. And it, it's pretty much what started me down this path of wanting to know more about fasting because it's not just about weight loss. It's obvious you're going to lose weight if you fast. What's more compelling to me are all the health advantages that pop up. Yeah, uh, I, I think for for me, just the, the, the fasting for my clients, uh, I have one client in particular that, that she has a habit of really under eating in her calories because she's got that calorie hypothesis thing going on in her head. And so I told her I would much rather you fast for a day than to under eat your calories because under eating does more damage than fasting does it and it goes against it doesn't make sense but it's true so for her you know I just tell her, I'd rather you just if, if you have to just don't eat for a day just fast and it, it kind of gives your pancreas a break you know it just it has a lot of benefits I think fasting certainly I, and one of one of my favorites is that it breaks food addictions Mm -hmm. Once you go on a 24, 36 hour fast, you're not craving, um, uh, you know, pancakes for breakfast. You, you tend to crave something healthy. At least I do. And you're yeah. not hungry. That's the thing that I, I try to communicate this, this to people that there's not this progression of more and more and more hunger. Actually, the longer I fast, especially beyond 48 hours, the more sated I get. And it's almost like I never have to eat again. Now, obviously you do, <laughs> but the feeling is there that you, really don't and you realize just how much of what you're feeding yourself and how you're feeding yourself and the frequency by which you're feeding yourself is pretty much irrelevant. You, sh you shouldn't be eating maybe as often as you think you are. My, my buddy, uh, Dan Pompa, and I'm sure you know Dan as well. Yep, know him well, yep. So my buddy Dan, he, he really feels that the feast is just as important as the fast. What do you yep. think about that? Yeah, I think, and, and what you feast with, and, and the timing of it, and how you break a fast, all of those things are, are things that are incredibly important. Um, yeah, I think Dan is, is spot on there, um, because once you reintroduce food after having fasted, your body's having to get adjusted now to that new nutrition, and you know, a lot of people say, well, should I fast before I go keto because it'll make it easier getting into keto? Well, if you come from standard American diet, that fast is going to hurt, by the mm -hmm. way, so don't do that. But maybe once you get keto adapted and you start spontaneously fasting, maybe push it three, four days and then slowly get back in it. I think you rev up the effects of keto with these, uh, with these longer fasts. Yeah, what, um, but, uh, you know, and once again, when, you, when I see people – out in Arizona, and they're going from standard. Uh, they're eating, you know, the, the fast food, the cookies, the cupcakes, all the stuff that we talked about. Usually one of the first things I tell them to do is to go all organic. Uh, that way you get to enjoy all the foods that you're still addicted to, except for the chocolate chip cookies organic, and the ice creams organic, and the cereals organic. So at least you gummy get bears. Out. <laughs> the gummy bears. They, yeah, yes. Yeah. Jimmy, come on, man. Organic gummy bears. Is that an oxymoron? Um, what but you're, you're onto something there. I, yeah. I do think the micronutrients of the organic ones give some satiety and give some level of sustenance that they weren't getting before rather than eating empty calories. It's still bad calories, but it's at least nourishing mm -hmm. to a degree. Mm -hmm. So I, I like that strategy. Just eat the healthier version of the crap, then we'll get you on the healthy foods eventually. 
Yeah, you know, because I mean, that way, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's, um, and also the, the chemicals that are in the, you know, this typical standard American diet, if all, I believe if all people did is get rid of all those chemicals, I think it's a big, big deal. I agree. Yeah, okay. we, we hold on to those toxins, and this is why some people struggle with um, weight loss or other health issues is because they're not they're not able to detoxify properly. The body holds on to these toxins in the in the body fat to protect the body from these toxins, and so um, there you know there are many reasons why their detoxification processes you know would be compromised. But absolutely, I mean it's hard to get away from chemicals nowadays. They're everywhere in our home in the environment. So yeah, I totally agree with you that if we could just just making small changes like that go a long way. Even switching out for essential oils instead of like the yeah. the air fresheners. It's it's little things you can do. Yep. Uh, and, and I agree with that, obviously, a thousand gazillion percent. And that's all in the medical literature, all that information about air pollution, outdoor, indoor, all of the you know, modern chemical toxins that are there. And it's in the literature that they're linked to metabolic diseases. So, you know, it's not like we're saying something that's outlandish. It's all there. Yeah. It's just the average medical doctor, obviously, is not reading it. Right. Who, who knew it's more than just the food? So... Um, we have a mutual friend, I'm sure, in Jack Cruz. And Jack Cruz says that all of the food gurus, aka Jimmy Moore, that they're all, um, you know, that they're all missing the boat on this one. It's all about sunshine. What do you say to that, Jimmy? I'm not opposed to sunshine. I'm, I'm, <laughs> we I'm love very, sunshine. <laughs> I'm, very pro, I'm very pro vitamin D and sunshine. Uh, and, and Jack Cruz has some interesting opinions that I. Uh, choose not to uh, participate in. Uh, so we'll just leave it right there. Speaking, speaking of Jack Cruz, and he, he lives in Louisiana, and he's an interesting fella. And our, and our industry is full of interesting people. And it, he passed interesting a long time yeah. ago. <laughs> <laughs> why, why can't, to go back and bash um, vegans, if we, if we can, um, why can't a vegan eat an oyster? Like what, what's the matter with an oyster? There's an, if, if it's, if it's an argument about, oh, I'm not going to eat anything with eyes. Well, it doesn't have any eyes. Um, does an oyster have any more or less feelings than a head of cabbage? Uh, tell me. Well, I mean, or shrimp. I mean, what, what these vegans fail to realize is how do these plants get, uh, get nourished? It's, it's from fertilizer and which is from animals. So, um, you know, I, I know for some vegans, it's a moral thing. They just, they don't like the treatment of the animals. And so for that reason, oh, everybody treats the animals wrong. So I'm not going to eat meat. Um, in, in all honesty, Weston A. Price, he was a dentist. He went around to these traditional cultures and observed what their diet was having uh, an effect on, you know, how it was affecting their teeth. And he found that all of these healthy societies all ate some animal product they all incorporated animal products in their diet they all ate sea salt they all consumed fermented foods and so in my and he found no healthy vegan society period and this is why Don't tell john mcdougall he may cry a little i know so this is why it's so important some form of animal uh, product because your animal products are your complete source of proteins uh, and they're they're rich in the B vitamins so oftentimes vegans will be deficient in B12 and they'll have to supplement with that so you know I know for most it's it's just a moral thing what do you think yeah it's sad the way that veganism has caught on so strongly because yeah I think the reason people feel so good Jack when they first go vegan is they're getting off of junk food and if you get off of junk food onto real food, even if it's lacking in certain real foods like animal-based foods, you're going to feel better for a period of time. But most vegans, and I even saw a statistic of a survey recently, 9 out of 10 vegans cheat. They have meat at some point. And so there's that primal call within them that says meat is a part of the natural human diet. And I think it's, it's very sad the way that this has held on for dear life, that veganism has become a thing when it's really the most unnatural diet you could possibly eat. And, and I think, you know, once again, some of the early data from uh, Dean Ornish and looking at angiograms and seeing plaque reversal, 
w w whether or not that's true or not, I, I don't. I don't really know. I never looked at the original films, I, and, and let's just say it's true. I think what happens is that you know you're starving the body. You're not starving the body in a good way, like somebody would do. Uh, not to not to conflate starving with with fasting, but that when you starve the body through vegan foods and only being vegan, the body starts to digest itself and it'll start to digest coronary plaque, but it also starts to digest organs and blood brain barrier and brain. And now you have all these different uh, mental issues. You have all these other health issues associated with, with being a vegan. And I think that also manifests itself in the behavior of online vegan personalities um, you know, I, I, I fear for them because they're lacking fat in their brains and I think it's affecting their mood. It's, it's, it's pretty profound. Well, and then also, you know, to that once again is that as they are vegan and they're not getting the omega-3s and I beg all vegans to at least eat seafood, at least start eating oysters or, or uh, uh, you know, sardine, anchovy, wild salmon, eat something like that. But then they're sitting, they're in the artificial light. They're not getting the sunshine. So now they've got this whole perfect storm uh, and they wind up uh, sick, they wind up suicidal, you know, whatever it may be. So, yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned Weston A. Price, Christina. Mm -hmm. um, how, much, how much raw dairy do you recommend to your clients? Um, well, it depends. Some people may have a sensitivity. Um, I know for me, it, if I consume too much dairy, then I have um, psoriasis outbreaks on the back of my scalp. So I, I know my limit, I, I eat very little of it. Um, so it depends on the person, but if they have, not everybody has access to raw dairy. We happen to live in South Carolina, so we have access, it's legal here. Um, so if they don't have access to raw dairy, I will tell them to do whole, whole um, dairy. Uh, not this low fat crap. And um, so it depends on the individual. Some people can handle a lot of it. And I just tell them to measure their blood sugar. Because I know for me, if I eat too much dairy, my, it'll raise my blood sugar. So this is where testing is important. It's highly individualized. There's something called bioindividuality. And so I can't make a blanket statement saying, okay, I recommend this much to all of my clients. Um, so I just say, okay, do what you feel comfortable doing, test your blood sugar to see how it affects your blood sugar, and if you see that your blood sugar is kind of elevated back off a little bit. Um, I will recommend if they have access to goat's milk or goat's cheeses, I tend to react better to those types of cheeses and, and dairy products, so I will recommend other types of dairy over the cow dairy. Some people are sensitive to some sort of uh, protein in it. Uh, so again, it's it's very highly individualized. I I personally don't consume a lot of it. Jimmy, what about you? Are you a dairy guy? Oh, I love dairy, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, you know, I've tinkered with cutting it out of the diet for periods of time, Jack. Uh, especially when I was in the paleo world, hot and heavy, going to conferences and things like that. Everybody was making the case for eliminating dairy just to see what would happen. And, and I did for a period of time, I didn't really notice any digestive changes or weight changes or anything positive. Uh, I, I think I did it for about three months and just no change. I'm like, well, it's hard to be keto without dairy. So I know you can, but it does give you more options if you can have high fat dairy. Yeah. And obviously if we want people to be successful, we got to give them a lot of different options and sure. I've kind of gone back and forth as well. You know, my book is The Paleo Cardiologist, but my book is not a diet book. My book is a lifestyle book. You know, it's about following the wisdom of our ancestors, living the life of our ancestors, which includes sleep and includes sunshine and includes chemicals, you know, out of the house and all the things that we talk about. It's not just about like the paleo diet. And the reality is, is that according to the medical literature, and we can all be critical of it and conspiracy say, well, some of that stuff is sponsored by the dairy industry. Totally true. I'm in agreement with that. Yet, the literature on the benefits of dairy regarding lipids, uh, regarding increasing HDL numbers, increasing HDL functionality, which I happen to think is the next kind of holy grail lab testing, is looking at HDL functionality. Because if you have a highly functional HDLs, you're going to do some really good uh, in your body. But um, I do understand our ancestors never chased down another animal to milk it and make cheese, butter, yogurt, and certainly not ice cream. Yet, 
I do think that there is some value, especially if you can find it raw. If you can find it raw from a quality source, I think you're good. Yeah, the quality is the key there. And yeah, like Christine said, we're one of only nine states that it's legal. And they're, they're increasingly trying to crack it down even in these nine states. So uh, I know uh, the West N.A. Price Foundation, Sally Fallon, that whole group are trying to bring real uh, milk back on the map again, realmilk.org or something like that is their website to try to campaign for getting uh, raw dairy back legal again in the illegal states. Well, and here's the thing. If we take everything away from somebody when we're telling them to change their diet it's going to scare them off and like you said people need options and having the dairy as an option make, does make it a lot easier i i feel for these people that that can't do it can't do dairy because it is a lot harder they, they're so limited options like a reuben sandwich <laughs> oh the reuben sandwich you know it's amazing I mean, you know, the federal government they'll go towards legalizing uh, marijuana across the across the country, and I don't have a problem with that necessarily. Uh, over in Denver, they're talking about having a, a refuge for uh, for uh, substance abusers and and crack addicts and meth addicts, so they can get like free needles and get access and have like a you know safe you know harbor you know over there. But the raw dairy, the raw dairy is going in the other direction. They're trying to get rid of the raw. Dairy. Well, and we live right next to a state here in South Carolina, in Georgia. If you cross over. Uh, into Georgia and they know that you grabbed uh, some raw milk from a South Carolina farmer, they will pull you over. They will make you pour it out on the side of the road and then you'll get a citation. I mean, they, yep. they treat you like a criminal simply because you want real whole food. Unreal. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the Healthy Heart Show, Real Food Keto by Jimmy and Christine Moore. Once again, pick it up. Jimmy, where can they find out, uh, where can they get the book? Obviously, they can get it on Amazon. You told me they can get it at Costco, which is, which is really cool. Yep. Um, tell me else and, and tell me how people find out more about you guys. Yeah, so we have a website for the book, realfoodketo.com, where we have links to where you can get the book, as well as uh, interviews that we've done for this book. I think, Jack, this is about number 40 <laughs> that we've done for the book, so thank you for having us on the show. I'm at livinglavitalowcarb.com, or if you Google Jimmy Moore, the first three pages is all my stuff, just means I'm old. I've been out there a very long time. But Christine, you have a website. I do. My website's rebootingyournutrition.com. That's where you can find me. Love it, love it, love it. And then, um, uh, uh, Christine, I know that uh, you guys have a big annual event. Are you, are you still pretty dialed into the, uh, to the National or to the Nutritional Therapy Association? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we're going this time. I, I went for the first time last year, and we're going to go again. The yeah, first time they ever let a keto talk happen yeah. at this one this year. Yeah, they're, they're getting into, they see the importance of offering a ketogenic um, option for their practitioners and so they're looking for more keto practitioners so yeah they we love our book by the way <laughs> we we love the nta i mean it's it you, there's it's it's a lot different than other communities that i've noticed there's there's an acceptance there of yeah. you know there's not this you know they they don't push people away if yeah, they don't believe the same greg graham's leadership does yeah that. yeah 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 you i know greg graham I, I spoke for uh, for biotics up in Portland a few weeks ago, and I met yeah. Greg for the first time, and uh, it was it was fantastic. <clears throat> and um, and then also just you know seeing the other NTPs uh, you know that were there that came up to me, just I mean they're they're so knowledgeable and just kind of soaking it all up. And that's why I say if someone has a health problem, you know they're must they're much better in the hands of uh, Christine Moore and one of these other uh, uh, NTP certified practitioners than than the hands of the medical doctor. That's for yeah. sure. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you guys for being on the show. I appreciate it. Best of luck. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Jack. Take care, guys. Bye.